Welcome everyone to the Bradford Seminar. It's a pleasure to welcome the latest addition to see the senior faculty, Professor Eric Tate. Um, Professor Tate received his BS in Environmental Engineering from Rice and MS in Environmental and Water Resource Engineering from Austin. And he holds a PhD in Geography from the University of South Carolina. His dissertation title was Indices of Social Vulnerability to Hazard Model of Search and Sensitivity. And I make that point of reading that uh, in the title of his dissertation, not the title of his talk. Because he's been at this a long time, and it's only recently that the cluster of issues that he's been concerned with from a research point of view, from a teaching point of view, uh, for, uh, forever in his career have now finally come to the attention of the people at the highest levels of government who are scurrying to address uh, the, the emerging climate problem in a context that actually means that people will address real people's problems in real places. And uh, the advantage of Eric being a geographer is that he knows how to do geospatial, place-based work. Uh, Eric's research has focused has since then focused on how to define and measure vulnerability in order to make these concepts useful tools of public flood policy. And as I said, that's something the governments are just finally waking up to. Uh, one of the interesting parts of what he's done is uh, investigate the implications of federal flood policy in terms of equity and access and outcomes. And uh, he's did one of the few analyses that I've seen, quantitative analyses, of where federal flood policy is effective and where it is serious not to be effective. Eric's focus on equity, spatial indicators of vulnerability, and public policy mean, as I said, that in great demand, as you can see from the various uh, policy-related activities at the federal level that he's become trained in. Uh, and I'd like his maybe comment on the pluses and minuses of doing so much public service. Uh, <laughs> he currently serves on the uh, Resilient America Roundtable at, at, of the National Academies as co-chair of the National Academies Study Committee on Spatial Screening Tools for Environmental Justice and as co-author of the Adaptation Chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment. Who? <laughs> the title of Eric's talk today is Disaggregating Vulnerability and Floods. Please join me in welcoming Eric Payne. Thank you, Michael. That was, uh, you actually really captured well sort of the developments that have been happening at the federal level. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, today. My focus today is going to be talking about methodology, essentially. And I'm going to use a paper that just got finished, and we're just about to submit, probably this week, uh, on um, a, a methodology for disaggregating vulnerability to floods. So here we go. So by now, many of us are familiar with the um, relationship between climate change and um, hazard extremes. So associated with climate change, we have increasing mean conditions, heat, precipitation. Um, but we also have increasing variance uh, so that we can have you know, really record floods, record precipitation, high intensity precipitation, and, and as well as drought as well. And so, we combine the mean and the variance, and what, what we have is an increasing uh, frequency and severity of floods. Uh, and we see this in the record, uh, not looking, most of the time with climate change, we're looking forward, but we can look back over the last century, and we're already seeing these changes in precipitation. So this is already uh, well uh, recorded. So a lot of times, people are focusing on the hydrologic dimensions of this, what's happening with land use change. But a bit, another big con uh, contributor to a great, uh, greater impacts is our rising vulnerability. And a lot of this vulnerability is due to the functioning of our social and economic systems. So I was part of this National Academy study five years ago that FEMA wanted us to look at essentially 
what's the impact of urban flooding in the United States? And so they wanted us to give a number, essentially, like how bad it is. Um, turns out we were unable to do that <laughs> because uh, the lack of, of data collection and standardized data collection. But my role on this report ended up being sort of focusing on human dimensions and some of the conclusions we, came, we found through case studies around visits around the country were that these impacts, they do tend to fall disproportionately and on who? Um, people that are living in poverty, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, recent immigrants, extremes of age, etc. And it, part of this is due to disproportionately residing in the places that flood the most. And so we see some of these impacts with the, uh, the massive precipitation events that we saw in California earlier this year. And these days, NOAA tracks a billion dollar disasters. And apparently, there's already been over 20 of them this year. So um, all, some of those related to hydrologic extremes. But focusing on the implications of equity uh, with floods, we need to disaggregate. So what I see a lot is studies, landmark studies, that are looking at some sort of uh, flood impact, whether it's you know, exposure, who lives in the floodplain, or what kinds of buildings are in the floodplains, to damage, to mortality, to disaster assistance. And they'll come up with um, top line estimates. So for example, this study, now this, if you all can't see it in the back, it says, our data show that the total US population exposed uh, is higher than previous estimates, and that nearly 41 million Americans live within uh, the 1% annual exceedance probability floodplain. So it's uh, 41 million people live in the floodplain, essentially, is the, is the highlight there. Um, but if we want to understand equity, then we need to disaggregate. Equity is a comparative concept about what conditions are not only unequal, but unfair. Um, and this disaggregation can occur geographically. You know, as geographers, we think a lot about uh, how environmental and social characteristics are distributed across the landscape. So this might be spatial, it might be across populations, or in this case, what I'm going to be talking about, both. And so to do this, we need to identify, we need to map uh, these characteristics. And over our, overall, this idea of equity um, has links to an, a related concept of social vulnerability. So social vulnerability is this idea that uh, certain populations um, consistently faced uh, higher adverse outcomes from hazards, extreme hazards, due to functionings of the social system, institutional characteristics, uh, economic characteristics, political characteristics. Okay? So we need to disaggregate. And so I do, my focus, big focus of my research is social vulnerability indicators. And we can use them to answer some fundamental questions. Uh, the first two, which places are the most susceptible and who are the most vulnerable? And this has been pretty much, this is an, a field that didn't really exist, the quantitative part, 20 years ago, probably just came to, started emerging 20 years ago. And so a lot of emphasis has been focused on these first two. Uh, over recent years, I've gotten a lot more interested in sort of the equity of, of disaster management and disaster policies. Uh, and more fundamentally, uh, how do these physical characteristics of floods interact with the social characteristics of floods? Because I think that's where um, the true understanding lies, these interactions. Okay, challenges. As you go from sort of the top to the bottom, uh, trying to analyze this becomes a bit more difficult. It's more challenging. So uh, lots of research on the first two questions, not so much on the bottom two. This is kind of where I'm spending most of my time lately, the last two. And um, the way that uh, most people go about, especially these first two questions of you know, who, what are the most susceptible places and who are the most vulnerable, the most common tool is the social vulnerability index. The general idea is people take characteristics from uh, quantitative data and they aggregate them somehow to come up with a single number. And um, it has a high level of policy appeal because you can take all of these complex characteristics and bring them into one thing 
And so uh, if you're new to the, the field, uh, if you're trying to do something about it, you don't need to know everything about all these processes. You can just have this one number and you can map it. You can compare places. You can use it to allocate resources. This is just happening over the last five years or so. And prioritize projects. Um, what I'm showing you here is uh, um, the structure of probably the leading social vulnerability index these days. It was created by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, so they have, I don't know, 17? I think they just changed. 15 now? Uh, indicators that they put together. Um, but there's challenges with this. And I'm questioning their policy fitness, um, because, and others as well, because this aggregation process can result in a number that's a bit statistically misleading. It's the, the way you do it actually matters quite a bit. And I don't think there's been much attention or thought about the methods for putting these together. It discards information. You just have this one number, but you don't know what's driving the vulnerability. Um, and you have no idea how these different characteristics interact, which ones of them are more important than the other. And so it points to the need for um, other types of methodologies. But yet, the, the, so the idea of a social vulnerability index is becoming more and more entrenched in federal, state, and local policy. During the COVID pandemic, the height of it, the National Academies came up with this report um, for trying to figure out what kinds of guidelines should, um, should govern the allocation of vaccines. And they came up with a suggestion that you should use this social vulnerability index to do it. So when I was starting my research in, as a PhD student in the, you know, 2006, 2007, not many people were doing this. And it was mostly academics that were looking at it. We were interested as geographers in the spatial distributions and stuff. We write all these papers talking about the index itself and you know, the kinds of what it, what it showed us. Um, but now, these things really matter. This is not just a paper. This is determining which places get money, which d don't. Who gets vaccines first? So there's real world consequences to this now. This is the, the BRIC program from FEMA, uh, building resilient infrastructure and communities. Essentially, they started off in 2019 with $500 million a year. Now they're up to a billion dollars a year. Essentially, it's an embodiment of this, the phrase, uh, a pound of prevention is worth, no, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So let's put our money in before the disaster to try and make places less, more safe. Um, and so what their first iteration, it was just on these physical characteristics. And there's, there's an outcry. You're ignoring the changes in vulnerability. So they started imbuing a social vulnerability index in their scoring. So now it's not just about whether are you doing an infrastructure project or, or you have a building code improvement. Where are these dollars going? We want them to be in places that have the greatest needs. And so we think a social vulnerability index can help us get at equity. Uh, the flood mitigation assistance program uh, from FEMA. This is trying to um, make investments in places that are covered by the National Flood Insurance Program, or the NFIP. And so it's also sort of pre-disaster monies that are going. Uh, social vulnerability indices are used, in this case, to figure out which places can get um, preferred treatment in terms of the federal cost share that's required. So typically, it's 75%. These places got to come up with 25% of the money for their, uh, their, their projects. But in places that are high in the social vulnerability index, they only have to pony up 10%. Okay. Um, and the latest thing, the most recent of these policies is called CEDARS. This just got this is the Community Disaster Resilience Zone Act of 2022, which just passed last December. And so this is designating spatially communities that are going to be at the front of the line for federal investment. Okay, But the trick of, of CEDARS is that the people pushing for its passage and actually applied the pressure through Congress was the reinsurance industry. Um, they're sitting on so much money through ESG um, goals, like environmental social governance goals. I think they're now rephrasing it. They're, they don't use that language anymore. They're just saying on a call this summer. But the idea is we want to invest in places um, to reduce social inequity. Where should they go? And 
the federal government declaring these as priority zones now is going to allow the flood of many more uh, uh, multiples of money that the federal government is investing in these places. Now, in designation of these cedar zones, it's using something called the National Risk Index. And in the National Risk Index, what is there? Guess what? A Social Vulnerability Index. So from this time where we we're just looking at, hey, let's do some papers and some do, do analysis. Now it's who gets, who gets uh, vaccines, whereas these billions of dollars are going. And every year, it's getting further and further entrenched. So how do we understand um, the mo who are the most susceptible? Indices are, are one approach. Um, a lot of other folks look at uh, disparities in outcomes. Um, so they use a, a whole raft of statistical and spatial methods like correlation and regression and spatial econometric modeling, hierarchical modeling. And so you see this reflected in papers saying stuff like uh, the top uh, is the ex aerial extent of flooding uh, was distributed inequitably with respect to race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Study in the bottom was looking at federal buyouts and who's getting these monies. They found that the program disproportionately targets whiter counties and neighborhoods, especially in urbanized areas, yet it is the neighborhood, neighborhoods of color in these places that have been historically more likely to accept buyouts in greater numbers. So there's a disconnect somehow and you know, who's getting these resources. It has something to do with technical capability as well to manage these grants. Um, I'm really dialed into people that are using spatial analysis methods to understand inequities. And so some studies, have, um, they look, here's the floodplain, here's not the floodplain. What are the population characteristics here? What are they there? Let's compare them. Do we see these, these disparities? Others. Are, have applied more inherently spatial methods, but like bivariate mapping. So you're doing these spatial overlays. Um, so you can say, where are the places that are both high in flooding and high in social vulnerability, for example, across space? Others have used univariate mapping. This is a univariate clustering map method. So within the floodplains, where are these concentrations of, of individual variables? Uh, I did some work. This last map is mine, a study a few years ago where we did bivariate clusters, social vulnerability and flooding across the US, and where are these um, spatially coincident, high and high, low and low, etc. Okay, so all sorts of these spatial methods. So we got indices, we got these uh, statistical approaches, we got these spatial approaches. And I don't think I don't think any of them are satisfactory for understanding, getting into the roots of uh, inequity. And so I think one approach that might actually be useful is this concept of intersectionality. It's, it's uh, made it mainstream now when you see it talked on Fox News or uh, about, you know, um, it's getting sort of wrapped into this idea of woke. Um, it's, so it's, it's made the jump from sort of academia to the mainstream discourse, okay? But originally, it started mainly through several authors, but one of the most prominent, her name is Kimberly Crenshaw. And so she was looking at intersections of different characteristics, so um, race and gender. So her ideas are basically what she was putting forth is that these intersections create outcomes that are different. So um, they're different from. Um, a white woman experiencing sexism, and they're very different from a black man experiencing racism. Um, that you need to look at these intersections. And what we see is that all of these approaches that I talked about, um, they don't really look from an intersectional approach. And this could be really missing something because um, the intersectional, intersectional populations, they have distinct outcomes. Um, Intersectionality behaves often in a way in which outcomes, adverse outcomes, are multiplied. They're not just added together. Um, and it helps us understand what the relationships between characteristics are. Um, the challenge is that intersectionality is typically analyzed in qualitative fashion, which can give rich understanding in a particular case study, but it makes it difficult to make it generalizable to larger study areas. And so there's a need for inter quantitative intersectional approaches, and that's kind of what I'm going to outline today in this paper. 
Uh, the challenge is that most disaster studies, they don't do this. Uh, but they probably adopt more, uh, this, this table here I show sort of this unitary approach, the multiple approach, the intersectional approach, and so on, so on, showing some of these differences. Most of the existing approaches are probably along the lines of this multiple, where multiple factors are considered, not looking at the connections among them. Um, and so there's a need for a more fundamentally intersectional research design. We saw this, I, I came here from Iowa this summer. We had a big event in 2020, this derecho, uh, which I taught about in class, but man, it was weird like living through one. Essentially, derechos are these long paths of straight line winds, 70, 100 mile an hour, hurricane force winds um, that are associated with sort of uh, supercell convective th thunderstorms. They're pretty rare. They flattened areas of Iowa, uh, where, near where I live. Power was out for a week. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of trees were, were felled. Um, but it had impacts that could be viewed intersectionally. Um, yeah, people were, if you're low income or underinsured or refugees, all affected, but it's a little <coughs> bit different if you're a low income refugee who's also a renter. Your challenges are different than just someone who's a renter or just someone who's a low income renter, okay? Uh, and for these intersectional populations, they hadn't recovered a year later. People were still out of their homes. Their kids weren't in school for a long time. They didn't have anything, you know, cl uh, clothing for the winter. Uh, so long standing, and they're not really uh, eligible for a lot of disaster aid. So there are some quantitative intersectional approaches that are out there. Uh, they're geographical. So things like uh, k-means clustering or hierarchical agglomerative clustering. That's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Uh, another approach called self-organizing maps. And you, there have been some papers over the last five, six years that have used sort of um, alternatively clustering approaches, typologies, um, archetype methodologies are all sort of the same thing. Um, trying to understand the collections of characteristics associated with heightened vulnerability rather than just looking at distinct income race, ethnicity, let's look at some of these combinations. So for me, my colleagues, uh, two main research questions structured our interrogation. Uh, the first, what intersections of vulnerability characteristics distinguish the major profiles of social vulnerability and flood exposure in the United States? So this is a nationwide study. Well for the coterminous United States. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times, places like Puerto Rico, Alaska, and Hawaii are excluded from these analyses because the data aren't uh, available. In our case, um, our flood data were available for the coterminous United States. Second question, how do social vulnerability and flood exposure vary across these profiles? Okay. So our, we had a couple major data inputs for this. The first is um, we needed a measure of flood exposure for the nation. So we started with a product uh, from this group in the UK called Fathom. They've done, it's really cool. Over Just over the last five years, there's been an explosion of data availability for hazard modeling. So they are now able to create continental scale flood maps that show flood extent and flood depth. Um, their first version was at 30 meter resolution. Every 30 meters, there's an, a value of flood depth. Uh, the one we're using is 10 meter, and I think they're about to come up with a new a version this fall. And so we got access to that, and we looked at the 500 year return period. A lot of analyses for flooding in the United States look at the 100 year flood, um, but we wanted to understand a more severe event, you know, as less or more frequent events, the, the extreme events of today are going to be more frequent in the future. So we wanted to look at the 500 year. But um, we don't just want to look at flooding everywhere. We want to look at flooding where people actually are. So we used a data set called the Microsoft Buildings Footprints data set. It's 127 million polygons. Um, and so now the analysis geospatially for large scales is you know big data. So we're merging 
um, this 10 meter depth grid data across the nation with all these building footprints to come up with a metric at each census tract um, that's the percent of percent of exposed buildings in each tract. And you see this, this spatial distribution here. Central California Valley, uh, the Louisiana coast, Appalachia really pop out as places with heightened flood exposure. So that's one, me one measure. Second measure is we created a, a, a social vulnerability index and use the individual indicators. So um, another prominent index is called, also called the social vulnerability index. It was created by University of South Carolina about 20 years ago. It's really prominent in academic research. And uh, modeled this across uh, 82,000 tracks in the nation. We used the statistical approach called principal components analysis to kind of um, um, create uh, factors of, of, of that have similar characteristics. And our output variable here is a social vulnerability index score. So we have the percent uh, buildings exposed per tract. We've got a social vulnerability score per tract for the nation. And so we're using this method called hierarchical agglomerate of clustering. Essentially, we want to understand what places in the United States are similar in their flood and social characteristics. And so this is a little diagram here. You've got um, six pieces of data that are labeled A, B, C, D, E, F. And um, in the first round, you figure out that, wow, B and C are kind of similar to one another, and D, e, D and E are similar to one another based on some sort of distance of some sort of characteristic. And as you can keep growing these clusters or agglomerating, right? And eventually you just have one, OK? And so we use this um, for our data and ended up essentially cutting at, um, this is our dendrogram, which shows the sort of the organization of these data. And we cut here. This horizontal line here that gave us six clusters, there's some guidelines methodologically for where you might want to cut. Um, so yeah, our, for our analysis, we ended up with six clusters associated these profiles of social vulnerability and flood exposure in the United States. Uh, this is sort of mapping these distributions. So um, what I'm showing you on the right is sort of the percentage of census tracts in the nation that belong to each one of these clusters. So this first profile is in dark blue. You can see this really prominent in the upper Midwest, in the Midwest, in sort of the northeastern seaboard, uh, Atlantic seaboard. Um, social vulnerability profile two is kind of light blue. You don't really see it very much because it's mostly in urban areas, which census tracts vary in size. So what you're seeing is sort of like these, these voting maps, right? The red and the blue in the presidential election. There's like the sea of red everywhere because it's large areas but smaller populations. Um, and so also five and six you don't see very much. These are also tend to be more urban. All right? So this is even though these clusters are not spatial, I mean they're in census tract. We're not using a spatial algorithm here. This is just clustering based on their characteristics we can map the resulting clusters, OK? So this is just a map. What we care about is like, what's the, you know, what are these clusters made of? And so we, we can look at each cluster and compare all the indicators to understand where they are with respect to their means in the nation. So some are going to be below and some are be above. And so in profile one, almost everything is below the mean of these social vulnerability characteristics. This is probably something having to do with low vulnerability. Um, profile two, um, and so I have some stars on some of these indicators. These, these um, designate when an indicator under a specific profile is at its maximum value. And so we use these to help dis, you know, label these profiles. So profile two um, has really high values for indicators of Asian populations, renters, and actually the lowest value for mean housing value. Profile three um, is much more rural, high concentrations or high levels of Native American populations and extractive industries, and so on and so forth, right? Four um, is the orange. F uh, five you have highlighted by characteristics of black populations, fe 
female-headed households, high poverty rates, and low vehicle access. In profile six, I Hispanic populations, low ling or high linguistic isolation, a lower educational attainment. And so instead of single variables, we're looking at these constellation of variables that define these profiles and that uh, accrue in specific geographies. So we took these, these, is, these are the six profiles that sort of addressing our first research question. Um, but we also wanted to understand how these variables correspond to social vulnerability and flood exposure. So what you're seeing here is sort of a dressed up box plot map. These are called violin plots that show sort of the median, the interquartile range, and the distribution of, of, of here of, of, uh, of social vulnerability across each profile. All right. So what can we do with this? We can, we can see um, how these values of social vulnerability vary across the profiles. In this case, it looks like there's a steady increase in social vulnerability from profile one to five, and then it drops down uh, again at six. Uh, profile one and two, their social vulnerability median scores are actually less than zero. So these are um, really low vulnerability from a social perspective. Um, where the others are above zero, five is the highest. Um, so this is sort of aligned with this idea of indices is this, this, what we call, my colleague would call the ordinal paradigm, where we think about social vulnerability in terms of its magnitude. Is it low, is it medium, or is it high um, for policy implications? Obviously, this, these underlying processes are so much more complex, but um, these indices, they kind of, they lose this information. Um, so even here, if you look at the profiles four and six um, in social vulnerability, they're pretty similar in terms of the median values. But if you look at like what's, in, in an index, you might say these places are the same. But from the profiles, they're very different kinds of characteristics. And if you're, you're trying to put these metrics into federal policies, the, the reason is you're trying to do something about it, not just because you want to map this stuff, right? So what are you going to do if all you have is an index score and you don't know much about these places? And if you, I don't know, should you try the same approaches in these places that have very different demographic constellations? You might actually make things worse, right? If you try to apply these one size fits all approaches. The image on the right um, shows how um, flood exposure varies across these profiles. So um, they're all really low. The distributions are heavily right skewed. So the vast majority of exposure values are closer to zero. But you see some differences in the distributions. Again, profile one, in addition to being really low socially vulnerable, 33% of the census tracts in the country, it's also lowest in flood exposure, okay? So here we have some alignment of a social dimension of vulnerability and a physical dimension of vulnerability that's a third of the nation, uh, roughly, well, in tracts. Um, so the highest flood exposure values uh, occur in profiles two, five, and six, um, which have also different constellations of what's in them. So let's take a look closer look at them, right? The overarching idea here, though, is that using the profiles, you can distinguish um, these sort of median values in social vulnerability or in flood exposure that otherwise you may not know that there's differences among them. So I, I'm interested in the extremes a little bit, not just these measures of central tendencies. So here's a look at the profiles. Uh, on the, the first column is the population. So for instance, profile one is 33% of tracts, so 37% of the population, OK? And these the, uh, places under this profile, um, they have really low social vulnerability. Uh, do I have a mouse here? No. So here, it's only 0.4% of the tracts in this profile have a social vulnerability score greater than one standard deviation. It's really low, right? But if lower than minus 
one standard deviation, the really low, it's 30 per, almost 29 percent of these of these of the tracks in these places. So um, th for the extremes, uh, and then also very uh, low exposure. So this place is, you know, these places are pretty safe, <laughs> pretty um, high well-being, low susceptibility for multiple dimensions. Uh, profile two, similarly low sorts of social vulnerability issues, but very highly flood exposed. Okay, so this profile has the highest mean housing value. It's primarily suburban. Um, so very different than profile one. Low social vulnerability, but really high flood exposure. Profiles three and four are somewhere in the middle. Um, these kinds of, you know, the images and the tables really draw attention to profiles five and six. Um, profile five, wow, in social vulnerability, all right, so this is eight, nine percent of the tracks in the country, but 55 percent of these tracks are in a state of social vulnerability that's greater than one standard deviation. So a lot of the tracks lie in the outliers, essentially. And so this particular profile um, was I'm trying to see what some of the main characteristics of this one are. Um, there's, this one was uh, black populations, um, poverty, female-headed households, vehicle access uh, were some of the dominant ones. Okay, but in terms of <coughs> flood exposure, it's high, but not one of the highest. By contrast, profile six, um, it has high mean, median social vulnerability, but at the extremes, not so much, but definitely really high flood exposure. So now we're starting to get into the nuances um, across these different profiles, and maybe we can do something about it. Okay. So I showed you the stuff at the national level. You, you know, it kind of obfuscates what's happening at local levels, but these profiles exist. So here's sort of a look in. And so profiles three and four, which are predominantly rural and dominating the national map, you don't really see them so much at the metropolitan scale. These are just some selected areas, New York, Houston, LA, and Chicago. Um, some interesting stuff like uh, profiles three and four, you see they're very spatially contiguous at the national level. You get that at the metropolitan scale, they're very dispersed. Um, and you can start to see the dominance of profile two, five, and six, which are more urban. And so trying to understand how these characteristics vary across space. So great, we've done all this mapping, modeling. So what? OK? So I, so conceptually, I think this work is really um, more work in this area is needed to understand that social vulnerability is not a number. It's actually a spectrum. And this spectrum can tell us things by, by thinking it in these terms and thinking it from an intersectional perspective as well. So five and six, essentially we came up with sort of a, a classification, a, a course classification scheme across these profiles. Profiles one and two, lowest concern. Um, definitely low social vulnerability, um, changes in and flood exposure, three and four moderate, five and six high concern. Um, so thinking about policy and where resources should go, not enough just to say where's the, phone, the index high, but maybe looking at these profiles as well. Because uh, there's, there's actually danger <laughs> in saying, wow, we, we care about social inequity. We are going to devise metrics, and we're going to imbue it in policy. And this is the place the metric says, we're going to invest here, right? And we feel good about ourselves. We've done a good job, right? Unless the places that you've said are the most vulnerable are actually not, right? It's kind of a false negative kind of thing, right? Um, and now you're not investing in these places, but yet you think you are? Um, and so it's almost like a re-marginalization of marginalized places that the, you know, the programs you're trying to put in place to reduce inequities are actually missing them. So these places, five and six, the most susceptible, they're potentially intersectional if in case, if in fact that these 
the effects of these intersections <coughs> amplify vulnerability in a way that's more multiple than additive. And when we're thinking about social vulnerability and measuring and mapping, typically the focus is on where is the most vulnerable, OK? The thing is, it's a spectrum. The most vulnerable cannot exist without the least vulnerable also existing, right? It's we're plowing resources and policy focus into the least vulnerable places, and that's why they're safe. That's why they're the least vulnerable. What are these places? Maybe we can understand vulnerability not only by examining what's dominating the vulnerability in the places with high, but understanding the processes that allow the places with low to avoid the vulnerability. So it's instructive, I think, to examine both ends of the spectrum. So that's, so the profile one is unambiguously a low concern. <laughs> it's a huge amount of the tracks. It's low in social vulnerability. Every, indic every single indicator is below its median. Um, and it has low flood exposure, OK? Social vulnerability profile two is a little bit more nuanced in that it has flat high flood exposure. What are these characteristics that come up? Renters, Asian population, uh, median house value are the most dominant ones. And OK, this is precisely the kind of thing that the profiles, I think, are helpful for. Now we can start to under ask questions of why. Like, what's happening here? And so you do a little bit of digging at the national level. This idea of one indicator for Asian populations is ridiculous, right? Because there's huge, just like a bimodal distribution with respect to income and socioeconomic characteristics. And, but it, overall, you put them all together, you, you aggregate them, right, like an index. And now it looks like Asian population as a variable is very well off, where uh, it's much more complicated than that. It also tells us something about renters as a vulnerability variable. Also has very different meanings wherever you are. Um, overall, though, maybe that these places, if you're trying, if core, if core objective is social, addressing social inequity, maybe you shouldn't be plowing a lot of re public dollars into these places. But yet, that's exactly what we do. We use an ostensibly objective measure, measures of benefit cost analysis to say, we're going to put money in where we're going to have the greatest economic return. This favors places with high asset values, like profile two, which has the highest wealth indicator of home value. So high flood hazard, high asset value, benefit cost analyses are going to favor these places. But clearly, the profiles are showing like this is, these are not the most places in need. Uh, we need to disaggregate race and ethnicity. There's this movement, a lot, you see a lot of studies, and I hope you all don't do this, where people scrunch together race and ethnic variables into something called like minority or non-white. Um, that's no good for this particular, I mean, we can see this. Each, each of these four race and ethnicity variables load onto a di completely different profile. They're totally different characteristics associated with. So Asian, Native American, Black, Hispanic, totally different modes of vulnerability. Putting them together, just you lose that understanding, OK? Um, and thinking about race and class, these are the principal axes of inequality that many people look at. You know, it's how things are operating. Um, but these, these are varying across these profiles, too. Home value with profile two. Um, lowest home value in profile three. Other characteristics, socioeconomic characteristics around employment and, ed and education associated with different profiles as well. We need to disaggregate race and ethnicity. Um, yeah, I talked about this a little bit about the, the BCA favoring interventions in profile two. I got a little ahead of myself here. Um, but certainly, profiles two, five, and six are heavily urban. Uh, maybe we should be thinking about urban and rural a little bit differently when we're aggregating resources, right? And, and, and how? Um, and I also think it has some implications for equitable adaptations. This is a big focus lately. Um, so here's some examples of green infrastructure, rain gardens, and green roofs, and 
um, grass waterways, these kinds of things, swales. And traditionally, the way we focus what we're going to do is what's economically efficient, what's physically effective. These are our modes. But maybe we need to think a little bit differently if social, social equity matters. How does this intersect with the most marginalized? But more importantly, why? How? Um, so we need a gateway into that kind of thinking. And so sort of this intersectional uh, approach, I think, is a quantitative approach that's not requiring a huge investment in qualitative analysis at local scales. You can get some sorts of understanding that then you could maybe know where you want to focus more. Um, disasters are not natural, <laughs> right? It's, it's these social characteristics that drive impacts. So it's not just how bad the flood is. We need to understand the social characteristics that lead to this as well. And so as we're putting a lot of money into flood buyouts, into green infrastructure, into uh, things to expand access to flood insurance, we need to understand these, how vulnerability operates, and it operates in an intersectional manner. Um, so just taking a look at social vulnerability profile six. OK, high. Which indicators are super high? I'm going to ask you all a question about this in a second. So. High flood exposure, high Hispanic population, linguistic isolation, and population density. Low educational attainment and health insurance. Okay, If you only have an index, I don't know how you tailor what you're going to do there. If you have some more information, what kinds of interventions might this suggest? Like I'm in class now. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Okay. You're looking at these indicators. These are great. Let's take it one step further, though. These are not just individual characteristics. Try and think intersectionally about how those might work. All right. Anyone else? What are kinds of policies? might be suggested by these, con these confluences of characteristics. Anyone? This is exactly the kind of thinking that we need, OK? And not this, oh, index tells me hi, put money there. We need to understand about these vulnerabilities. And so you have agencies, you have partners um, that, are th that are thinking about these things. But now, but these agencies are populated by people that never had to think about social inequity before they got there. Maybe like people in HUD, and maybe some in the CDC that are looking at social determinants. But by and large, our, our federal, state, local governments, understanding social inequity is not a precursor for getting that job, right? And yet now we've got billions and hundreds of billions of dollars in, in, in the hands of, of people that don't have this background. They're trying to figure out how to do it. So they're just grabbing it. Oh, here's a social vulnerability index. And now it's, it's actually in the law. Thou shalt use this measure, OK? So to finish up, you know, there's this integration of these methods into policies. Now the stakes are much higher for research methodologies. People that are studying this need to you know, show up and provide some alternative methodologies so we can get a more nuanced understanding. We need to understand who are the most vulnerable. It's not enough just to identify disparities. Now we want to do something about it. How can we start to think about solutions? Uh, well, we need to think about social vulnerability in a more nuanced way. And um, we need this pivot or our focus on equity is going to be um, insufficient, OK? So I wanted to, oh, I, that slide messed up. I'm teaching a class in the spring. Uh, if any of y'all are interested in learning more about the uh, policy dimensions, the physical dimensions, the social dimensions, uh, the psychology, all of this associated with hazards and disasters, uh, take my class in the spring, and uh, we'll get into it, OK? So thank you.
Uh, I wanted to acknowledge my co-authors on this. Uh, Samuel Rufat, he's in Paris. Asif is uh, a PhD student he just finished in August. And uh, many of y'all know Shelly. She's back here. Uh, she contributed uh, um, really uh, importantly to this development of some of these measures. So uh, thank you for your time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, first, I was just curious what year So the census is in five-year increments. We use the ACS of 2017 to 21, I think it's in here. Uh, no, we didn't compare it to those measures because I mean, we've done that in other studies. That wasn't really our goal here. It was more to show what a quantitative intersectional approach looks like and what, how that compares to the, uh, ex, you know, what's out there. So um, I suspect we'd find similar things. Uh, the social vulnerability index we did was not the CDC's model, but I suspect it'd be similar. Yeah, the thing is, it's so context specific. What I'm doing here with floods may be different for wildfire. You know, what we find in LA may be very different than the processes in Houston. Um, and so I don't, I don't actually believe, I think there's limits to how, what kind of generalizable understanding you can get from there, right? So what I'm suggesting here is this is like a screening approach where it helps you identify, learn a little bit something, then you need to go on and do that. I will say, you know, disaster researchers using qualitative methodologies are too few, and modelers are not using their information. So that's where all this rich understanding lies. Uh, and, but most modelers are approaching this as data exercises. And let's use the cool new algorithms, and let's do this new stuff in R, and not really thinking about how vulnerability works. Um, so that's a huge need. Not well understood. Eric, I'll ask you a question. Hmm. So this is essentially a principle for corporate analysis. And so you could, uh, just like with any system, you do something like this with uh, sometimes the proponents make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the policy is going to be in process, where you know you can use these kinds of screening tools, and then it's more prescriptive on okay, you need to make uh, build collaborations with the types of organizations and stakeholders represented by the dominant indicators. You need to understand in these specific places and geographies how these factors interact. Um, so. This kind of stuff is not for maybe identifying places at risk, like these indices, but it's more for like what are we going to do about it? How should, not, not maybe not partially where should we invest, but how should we invest? 
And so this has got to be just the first step. I don't think anybody should be making any decisions based on strict on, on resource allocation based on these profiles. It's more to qualify the quantitative information. So yeah, process, I think. Oh, 100%. And if those are integrated? They are not, right? This is purely susceptibility. But, but and it relies on assumptions, right, at the population level. But we know through things like uh, you know, social capital, for example, that people can build networks, that these networks give them resilience, they give them access to other resources. Uh, you know, a real famous case with like f disaster studies is like after Hurricane Katrina, like uh, Vietnamese fishermen in uh, Louisiana really, you know, got together. And so, from a quantity, you know, these thirty thousand foot quantitative method, you say you're, you know, this is likely to be a vulnerable group. But in this case, they had high capacity that blunted that, and they were able to withstand impacts that others um, were not able to. And so there's other, ex other examples, from like you know, the Chicago heat wave. And you look at all these disasters, there's capacity. And so this, this is another reason, like, this should just be for screening. It shouldn't be used for, you know, this is vulnerable, this is not. That kind of labeling is not helpful. All right? <laughs>